to the Lost World Minute, the Minute by Minute podcast viewing 1997 sequel Jurassic Park, one minute time. I'm Brad. I'm Dave. And today we're here to discuss Minute 51 of the Lost World. Dave, it's been two weeks, we're back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah. Uh, timings just don't line up, and last week they just didn't line up, so we... No, uh, unfortunately not. No, we're working hard on the uh, listener week behind the scenes and collaborating mm-hmm. all the uh, all the answers, and uh, we'll have a, a special show together. Um, reviewing yeah. that shortly. Site B was the factory flaw. It's so important to the future that you not finish that sentence, please. Before we get into 51, we do have a, a leftover question that uh, wasn't answered um, on the last or the last show we done, and that was uh, from Matt. And do we think Usul Sorno is still in canon in Jurassic World or the uh, Jurassic World trilogy? I should say. I, this stems from uh, early production stuff or early in Jurassic mm-hmm. World's production stuff that. Uh, Sauna wasn't going to be mentioned, and what happened in the Lost World and Jurassic Park 3 um, was not going to be addressed in Jurassic World at all. Um, no, uh, Trevor really wanted to do just a sequel to the first movie, so he really wrote, he kind of rewrote it so that we wouldn't have to deal with anything that the second or third movies brought up. Of course, there are the small little um, cameos and stuff that we see in the background to the Innovation Center in Jurassic World, but we never actually get any kind of dialogue that explicitly states that these movies are still around. Of course, Trevorrow did say, he backtracked a little bit and said, yes, they are still canon, the movie's just not going to deal with them. Yeah, and that's that's perfectly fine. It's, as, as you said, he wanted to make a sequel to Jurassic Park. It's not... A, or it is a sequel to Jurassic Park, but it also does come after. Um, for instance, you got you got the book of Malcolm that's got his Lost World photo on it. Um, mm-hmm. And I suppose this also is another sort of nail in the coffin to the fact that that, or to the comments by marketing that that Spinosaur is from from Sauna. Um, because if this was the case, then that wouldn't be at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I mentioned, in the Innovation Center, we can see photos of a male T-Rex on one of the um, on one of the podiums that one of the interactive podiums and in the background you can also see the Jurassic Park 3 male raptor um, it's uh, up there on one of the walls I'm not sure which one yeah yeah and I'd like to say that um, well you can tell a lot more in the production photos of the uh, the raptor pack but um Apart from the one that's very sort of sauna-ish, um, I think that's Charlie mm-hmm. with the uh, avian eye. Um, the, the, sort of the raptor, especially blue, is sort of a, the next version after the raptors we've seen in Jurassic Park Three. Um, mm-hmm. Just that again, that natural progression in film as more information's learnt, and we get sort of. Well, speaking of the, uh, speaking of the. Raptor Squad, there is actually kind of some interesting physiological differences between them. I think it's Charlie and uh, Delta that have more of a Sorna Raptor snout, where they got the raised ridges on the side yep. of the snout. And Charlie, or no, Charlie, uh, Echo and Blue seem to have seen more uh, like the Nublar Raptors, where they uh, have that kind of smooth uh, square snout, you know? Yeah, well, it's sort of, it's sort of the, the new blood ones are sort of boxier, where the sauna ones are a lot more pointy. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my unscientific way of <laughs> telling it, but um, uh, it's really hard to call them the raptor squad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I dislike that a lot. <laughs> um, it's uh, cutesy. Yeah. Not too cutesy for my taste. Yeah, yeah. But, um... But, yeah... Yeah, it's 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 in canon. Um, a lot it's happened before where sort of new films that come out to be sequels to the original, or uh, for instance, take the uh, the failed or the cancelled Neil Blomkamp's Aliens mm-hmm. um, sequel. It was going to be set after Aliens, and the only way it was going to work was to have some sort of a time jump or dimension skip or something, so I could cancel out uh, Alien Free and Alien Resurrection. Um, mm-hmm. Those two films would still be in the canon, but I think that'd be in a different timeline or so. Just, it was going to be some weird way that worked, but um, 
we don't have time travel in Jurassic Park, luckily, so... <laughs> um, and yeah. the, uh, the new Halloween movie is going to do that, the one coming out next year with uh, Jim Lee Curtis. Is gonna, she just announced she's going to be in it. Oh. And so it's going to be a direct sequel to the first Halloween from 1978. They're going to cut out every single sequel, including the second one, just because Carpenter never really liked... He was kind of forced by the by Universal Studios to put the sister angle into there, and he never really liked it. So he's gonna write that entire thing out. He's just gonna be go back to Michael being the original premise, which was the babysitter killers it, it, killer. He was just knocking off babysitters. Interesting. Yeah. And anyway, so um, going forward into Fallen Kingdom and whatever the. Uh, third film in the trilogy is going to be called uh, whether or not sauna is mentioned i'd like i'd like it to be but um we'll just have to wait and see we've just passed the anniversary for the lost world so hopefully there's some some mention mm-hmm. of it uh, we got malcolm back so surely something's something's got to be mentioned even if it's just i've been chased by these things for 10 years or mm-hmm. yeah so it's still in canon yeah well, there's also supposed to be in um, the next movie, uh, Sorner is supposed to have something to do with it, something about the bad guy or something like that, but I just don't know. Like I mentioned in previous minutes, I don't know how much if it, or it'll be in it, if it'll be mentioned by name or if it'll even be seen at all. Yeah, yeah that, friend, that's... Like I said in yeah, the previous minutes. Yeah, that's it. You hear, you hear sort of rumors and whispers out there of what's going to happen and stuff like that we i heard the same thing about jurassic world and a lot of it wasn't even in there it was just people starting rumors and it wasn't even uh wasn't even in the final film so yeah true until you until we see a trailer with something in it or we uh get to sit in that seat and watch it for ourselves which of course i i hope we get a trailer out by uh thanksgiving at least because that's last time we uh Jurassic World had his things had his trailer out for the Thanksgiving American football game. Hmm. So. Yeah. Can we just not do a teaser for the teaser? Yeah, I, I know. know. That was um, so ridiculous. It um that got a lot of people rubbed up the wrong way to start with before the film even coming out. So. A lot I of... will say that teaser for the teaser though was probably the most impressionable bit of marketing for me for the entire film. Yeah. That that slow piano mix of the. Uh, first of the original theme and it was just great you all you get is like these scant clips with the theme playing over it yeah and I, that that had the uh the monorail going through the gate too didn't it and just, yeah uh, just the flyover of the uh mosasaur pen or lagoon uh-huh. yeah it was just a quick 30 second uh teaser for the teaser in fact and i thought it was great though it yeah. probably it had the most impression in me. It's my favorite, it's still my favorite bit of marketing that we've had for the film. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we're not we're not sort of saying don't show us anything. Just just space it out a little bit. Don't call it a teaser mm-hmm. for a teaser. Just call it teaser one. Release the second teaser or the first trailer uh, a little bit later. The start on the front of Star Wars or something, and uh, mm-hmm. and then give us the big one for Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, Star Wars uh, definitely knows how to market their movies so that you want to see them. Even, they could market a two-hour uh, clip of a dog taking a dump, and <laughs> they could market it in a way that people would spend... It would get at least half a billion dollars on opening night. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Malcolm downstairs. All right, Dave, ready to get on to Minute 51. All right, sure. As we ended Minute 50 of The Lost World... The deafening roar of the Tyrannosaur could be heard, prompting Ian to take action. As we start minute 51, Eddie continues to help Ian put his harness on, as he prepares to repel from the high hide. All the while, Kelly's pleading at him to stay here and to not go. He tells Kelly that he'll be right back, and that he gives her his word. Kelly retorts with, you never keep your word, and slams a fist down on the rail of the high hide. 50 minutes and 24 seconds, Ian doesn't reply. He looks down and leaps from the high hide, falling fast to the forest floor below. At 50 minutes and 31 seconds, we cut back to the trailer 
as Sarah's attending to the baby's leg, wrapping a bandage around the cast that's been put on there. At 50 minutes and 40 seconds, Sarah realises she needs something adhesive, something pliable to add to the baby's cast, and asks Nick to spit his gum into her hand. At 50 minutes and 54 seconds, we cut back to the high hide. Treetops begin to sway, branches begin to crash. Something very large is moving fast through the jungle below them. And this ends minute 51 of The Lost World. So we open up on 51. We got here a little bit differently in the early script. Originally, uh, Eddie, Judson and Kelly went back to the high hide where uh, Malcolm, Sarah and Nick were the ones sabotaging the camp, Hunter's camp. And uh, they returned to the trailers with the baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of uh, I'll go. Ian talks about, I was going to say, and of course, Ian also gets to make his gambler's ruin speech where he, where that's direct from the novel, where he says that bad things cluster. You know how they always say bad events happen in threes? Yep. That's um, the basic premise behind gambler's ruin, and he's talking about how when things go bad, they tend to stay bad. Mm. And he sees this, bringing this T Rex to the trailers as bad. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, that's it, and um, in the novel especially, it's uh, everyone except for uh, Levine is in the trailer when Eddie brings the injured baby back, um, mm-hmm. and he's injected with 10 to 20 cc's, which knocks it out completely, but um, Levine tells Fawn to bring the kids and um, and Eddie, pr- and pretty much everyone, and get him out of the trailer, because he knows that uh, bringing the baby back there is not a very good idea, um, and we sort of get that um, that carried through with Malcolm when we get to the trailers. Um, up in the hide, Kelly's pleading with Ian to stay, not to go. Um, and we've got Eddie still helping Ian put his harness on, which just looks like a belt. It doesn't look like he steps in any any fire guards or anything like that. No. Um, but uh, Ian crouches at, at Kelly's height and uh, recites the, uh, the quote to her, the Queen Goddess of My Inspiration line that we had mm-hmm. from earlier. Um now I've googled that to find meeting and it only comes up with Ian using it in the film, so that's just something created for the film, it appears. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, it's great here too, because in the background Eddie's got his rifle in hand looking off towards the sound of the T-Rex that we heard last minute. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not he'd be prepared to fire, I suppose we see later. He, uh, he definitely wants to fire to save his life, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, the the front sight gets caught in the netting. Yeah, yeah, very unlucky. (laughs) Um, But Ian Ian climbs over the railing for the hide, looks back at Kelly and says, I'm coming back, I'll be right back, I'll give you my word. And Kelly and Anger sort of, but you never keep your word, which may be another hint at uh, Ian sort of not really being the father he should be. Yeah. And because it's... uh, it's a completely different scene in the pre-San Diego script. That, uh, we don't know if this is something from a later script that was cut or just a, just a callback that doesn't really need to be here. But and I love he sort of he gives her a look here where it's just he knows he can't fight her. Yeah, um, it's like a ooh snap. Yeah, you know? yeah. He and... just he can't <laughs> retort to that. Yeah, and then he just sort of, he looks down and lets go. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we get this, the sound effect, the whoosh, the crack, the thump, <laughs> as he hits the ground. And uh, <laughs> and the great line from Eddie. I squeeze just a little bit higher. Yeah. Higher <laughs> yep. Which, yeah, a, a wet rope aside, um, mm-hmm. you're especially you're repelling in darkness too, you'd, you'd want to think that that work light's still on, a, on the, down at the... Uh, M class at the ground level, but um, no, he uh, he drops pretty quick, <laughs> and we see him sort of later when he's running through the jungle. He's sort of he's got a little bit of a limp there. He's not running at full stride. No, uh, yeah, he's limping a little bit now. Yeah. Um, and also, is um, a nice callback to the fact that yes, he does have an injured leg from the first movie, mm. and he, that injury can be kind of. Uh, brought back a little bit every now and then because you see that he uh limps after he falls down a hill after yeah running through the long grass yeah i i thought it was uh 
during the trek we see him sort of limp with uh, Kelly under his arm. But yeah, yeah, you mentioned it when you get yeah. Sarah and that help him up. There too, I think. Yeah, Sarah helps him up and they sit down in the boneyard while uh, Nick runs ahead. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, but he's limping at the um, he's limping when they're trekking as well. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, as we said earlier, like a lot of that stuff's been cut from the film where he was doing his leg exercises and that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we uh, we cut back to the trailer and Sarah's working on the baby's leg, um, <laughs> and then we get the, the she needs another adhesive, some pliable that will, and then she sort of trails off and looks at Nick chewing his gum, and you can that sound of him chewing just gets louder and louder. <laughs> <laughs> which it's sort of there's a bigger section in the novel that goes into discussing how to set the baby's leg um i think one one good thing about having this last week off i managed to uh buy the buy the book and uh go through and sort of read up on what was happening here novel wise um yeah and it's sort of an argument about making stuff light but strong um mm-hmm. and they end up using a foil splint or a foil cast to uh have a split line yeah, which I always thought was kind of weird because if you ever touch the edge of aluminum foil, it's sharp, you know? Mm. Yeah, well, they mention uh, in the novel they brought a heap of a, some type of resin that uh, you could melt and set rock hard, um, which Sarah mentions would kill the baby because the uh, cast wouldn't come off. Um, yeah. But... Uh, they sort of they they use the foil and then wrap it in the resin and just have this split line so as the baby grows it'll split the foil and uh, and fall off again. I'm pretty sure the the book and the uh, digital book the pages all line up because you get one page per sort of page on the reader. So if you want to check it out in the novel, it's page 239. Um, you can check that out. But uh, in the um in the prescript. In the pre-San Diego script, we also get a scene where Nick is uh, helping Sarah apply the foil on the resin cast. Um, it's just completely missed here. We actually see Sarah wrapping the leg in um, a bandage, which I don't know why. I don't know what her reasoning is there. If she's thinking the bandage is going to rot off after time, or because um, we clearly see it on the baby's leg at the end of the film. Mm-hmm. How many days yeah. later? Um, but uh, Sarah holds out her hand and asks Nick to spit. It's uh, Arby in the novel that uh, suggests using the chewing gum to Sarah, but uh, she dismiss- dismisses it. But then it's later used to hold the foil in place while uh, Sarah's mm-hmm. applying the resin. I chew gum occasionally. Uh, is gum in America sticky at all? Uh, it depends. It's, if, it's not sticky like right after you spit it out, but after you... Um... After it dries out a little bit, yes, it does get sticky. Yeah, yeah, I know, mainly from school, if you you sort of stick it to the underside of tables or something, over time it will harden and uh, stick pretty f- steadfast to it. But uh, Yeah, it does harden and become brittle, which is would allow it to, um, the, uh, what is it, the bandaging here to unravel itself and fall off eventually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay, so it is plausible then. Yeah. I suppose I just have to wait long enough for it to set. <laughs> yeah. dry out enough. I don't. I didn't see a hairdryer anywhere, but... Uh, but uh, Nick spits in a hand. Uh, not, <laughs> not, not, <laughs> not the gum. And, uh, yeah, just like a nice fat loogie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's not in the... Uh, that's not in the pre-San Diego script, so that's obviously a Spielberg uh, inclusion there. Yeah. But, yeah, ew, your gum then wipes her hand on Nick's vest when she's wearing g- gloves, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> he wipes it back on his vest anyway. And uh, the baby's slowly starting to come awake here too. It's starting to sort of growl and call yeah. out. But then we, uh, we cut back to Eddie and Kelly in the high hide, and... Um, we get a fantastic shot. Again, we discussed last minute how this is all just reproduction, but um, we got a view out over the trees, and they begin to sway, and something big mm-hmm. is moving, moving through the jungle. Mm-hmm. And, and it's uh, great. It's almost um, it's not at all like the first movie where we get a great first reveal shot of the 
T Rex, and this is more almost like a horror movie where all you get is brief glimpse, brief glimpses of like a shadow or uh, trees moving. In this case, yeah, no, yeah. Well, that's it. In the first movie, we we got the saw the leg on the roof as a jump scare, then the reveal of the T Rex eating the goat on the other side of the fence. Uh-huh. Um, and we've seen we've seen the Rex. We know what sort of damage can do. Um, it's sort of I suppose getting to this next minute. It's not really established here when they're moving through the jungle. If it's one or two, um, you could assume it's only the one um, mm-hmm. because we only seen the one before, and we know that uh, Roland's there to hunt the buck. So you'd presume sort of you'd only be seeing the buck in this film, but uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> we're uh, we're about to learn that's not the case at all. Um, yeah, I grew up so much with this movie. I, I don't even know what my initial reaction would have been about it. Of it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anything else on fifty one you want to bring up before we get out of here for the day? No, I think we're good. All right. All right, guys. Let's get the hell out of here. Contact details are on the website thelostworldminute dot com. You can email feedback to thelostworldminute at gmail dot com. Facebook the Lost World Minute. Twitter at the Lost World Minute and Instagram the Lost World Minute. Easy to remember. Yeah, yeah, very easy to All remember. Right. <laughs> uh, David, thank you for joining me for this recording. You're welcome. And uh, we'll be back. I've been Brad. I'm Dave. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. Goodbye. Talk to you later. Bye. It is absolutely imperative that we work with the Costa Rican Department of Biological Preserves to establish a set of rules for the preservation and isolation of that island. These creatures require our absence to survive, not our help. And if we could only step aside and trust in nature, life will find a way.